My name is Richard Dangerous, and this is Avian Dangerous. <laughs> and usually dangerous, I think you'll agree. It's time to do a little bit of topical stuff. Time to talk politics. <laughs> Heavy! Well, is it a penis or is it a swan vesta? You just can't tell sometimes, can you? I'm here in Soho, mainly to pick up my copy of Spank Monthly, but also to stare in reverential awe. For it was here 20 years ago the revolution began in a small club in a strip joint in this building. The club was called the Comedy Store, the home of a brand new style of humour that was called, for want of a better alternative, alternative comedy. The great classic comedians of history. <laughs> you know, people often say to me, Alexi, what is alternative new wave Marxist comedy? And I say, shut off, you nosy bastard. <laughs> to me, alternative comedy meant, in its simplest form, non-racist, non-sexist comedy. Sexist in comedy and everywhere else. Let's try and get together and get rid of it. My name's Ben Elton. Goodbye. I think that that came out of a kind of collective decision that we wouldn't allow anybody to do all that stuff, you know, because artistically we hated it and also it was, it was just horrible. Uh... Can you find the act? No. Oh, we're um, on air. Can you not look into camera, please? Please, we're on air. Don't look into camera now, please. Don't look um, into camera. <laughs> At the time, there was alternative London, there was alternative eating, there was alternative everything. So I suppose alternative comedy was a sort of handy, handy name. I came on the train, think I managed to pass it off as an asthma attack. <laughs> the initial explanation was non-racist, non-this, non... Oh, God, oh, dear, but really, that just... I can't even bother to finish the sentence because I'm just exhausted by that, the trappings of that word. But I, don't, I was never meant to be that dull. a couple of years after punk, but it was the same principle, the idea that it doesn't really matter what you are, anyone can get up and have a go. With punk, you had a kind of performance style in which you didn't say, you know, you're a wonderful audience, in which you actually attacked your audience. It was important that you had your own voice and you were inventive and original. That was more important than your politics. You're drunk! I couldn't even deny it. I just went... <laughs> An alternative comedian is someone who is disliked or hated by mediocre and intelligent people. The trouble is that according to the experts, there's only seven jokes in the world. <laughs> An alternative comedian is bitter. <laughs> That's one of them. Six are about jelly. Indeed, most early alternative comedy was a triumph of style over content. It was what the Aussies call spunky and what the Americans call in your face. Pretty unpleasant combination, although not that unusual in Soho. The comedy store bear pit atmosphere soon made it the only place to go in town if you wanted your comedy young, aggressive, and just a couple of minutes from a massage parlour. It's become the stuff of legend, and like all legends, there are disputes as to the facts behind it. Even today, Peter Rosengard and Don Ward, the odd couple who ran the club, still disagree about who had the original idea to start it. Let the bitching begin. I was on holiday in, uh, I think it was the summer of 78, and uh, first time in Los Angeles. and said to the hotel porter, where's a good place to go? He said, well, have you been to the comedy store? I said, no, what is it? He said, it's a club for comedians. So we went down there on Sunset Strip and I just literally fell out of my seat laughing. I know I'm changing, you know, because when I was like 20, I could lay in bed and piss into the toilet. <laughs> Look at this, my God. Somewhere, else. oh, is it a purse? Is it? It's more than that. Wait, don't. We're casting nets into the sea. <laughs> and thought, why haven't we got one in London? And, and I thought, well, I'll open one in London. And why not? 
So I went out around town looking for a venue, and then somebody introduced me to a strip club owner called Don Ward. Well, he also had a, a nightclub, kind of a hostess nightclub called the Gargoyle. And it had the full schmear of the day, you know, the, the full uh, Monty of uh, striptease. I said I'd find the comedians and promote the thing, and he'd supply the premises and the staff, and we shook hands, and that was it. No. No, there's, um, it was, we both had the same idea. No, he didn't think of the idea. No. I owned the premises. Uh, I brought Peter in, and you might as well say, as a gopher. I had the idea of putting an ad in Private Eye. I think it cost me 50p. It was one line, and I got two replies from that ad. This bloke was standing in the corner of the uh, club, chewing gum. I think he was in a leather jacket. He looked pretty tough character, as a matter of fact. And he was just kind of... He, he looked, had this look of contempt on his face, I think, for anything he'd been watching, because he'd been watching, everybody watched the other people audition. You get your dad's crash helmet, and you put that on, wouldn't you, like that? And you get a great big pair of industrial uh, gauntlets, and you pull them on, great big pair of fishing wellies, and you pull them up tight like that, when you tie them at the top. The more I saw this advert for the comedy stuff, and uh, Soho then wasn't the kind of yuppie playground that it is now. And she thought it might be some elaborate scam where they got you to pay £300 for a bottle of ginger ale masquerade and champagne. <laughs> and so she said, if you ask you to have a drink, say no. Thinking that Peter Rosengard was some kind of Soho hostess. <laughs> Hello, dearie. <laughs> Ugliest bloody hostess you'd come across, really. He did a five minute piece. A couple of pieces, I think. And they were brilliant. Soup, you, see. you get the oxtail soup and you'd have a can open under your bed. You'd get it out and you'd open this tin of oxtail soup and you'd pull just a little bit of it on your legs, wouldn't you, like that. And then you'd pull your goggles down and you'd pour most of it in your wellies and then you'd jump up and down, wouldn't you? you'd... I was just terribly confident. I was just, you know, I mean, I had, I had that gift and they could see that right away, that I was a million miles better than anybody else that they'd seen, really. And you could see it kind of palpable. Kind of relief spread across the faces of Don and Peter. Yakida! 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 And uh, I said, you are on the opening night. In fact, you're my compere. <laughs> I'll do you, sunshine. <laughs> the other guy I got was a Scottish Jewish accountant called Arnold Brown, who was wanted to be a comedian. Scottish and Jewish, two racial stereotypes for the price of one. <laughs> I used to submit ideas and got a few one-liners and sketches accepted for uh, weekending on Radio 4. And uh, that was a kind of good training ground for constructing one-liners, which became the basis for my act. I I'm a one-liner kind of guy. Don't like too much applause. That's how fascism started. <laughs> Just about an hour before I'd opened, I suddenly realised that I'd read in America that you needed something, uh, they had a light that flashed at the back of the club to tell the comedians when it's time to get off. And I hadn't got one of these. And so I panicked and asked a friend of mine called Billy the Kid. Billy, I said, look, can you nip up to a theatrical prop shop very quickly before they close? So he came back with this huge J. Arthur Rank gong. My great-great-grandfather, uh, he actually caught Moby Dick. <laughs> well, they, can, they can cure that now, of course. <laughs> the first night was an appalling night because it was a sort of press night and they packed it with journalists and people and given them lots to drink and of course the journalists with lots of drink just sat around talking to each other and they were supposed to be a comedy audience so it was a completely pointless experience you'd go up and do some stuff you didn't know whether it was good, bad or indifferent because they weren't listening What's that in? Who's that in? Three, four, five it was pretty dreadful. I can't remember the acts really. I can remember that. I, you know, I was the only thing worth seeing. <laughs> you said, "What part of lesbian did you come from, dear?" <laughs> it a fell he'd won seventy-five thousand pounds on the pool. Seventy-five thousand pounds. No, shut up when the fellas talking. Shut up. My only preparation for that evening was to do one very, very small joke uh, about being an accountant. And the accountant joke was my very first uh, foray into performing. It wasn't a very good joke, but I thought it was all right. And that's all I had on the opening night of the comedy store. Uh, I said to the audience, the drunken audience, champagne, everything, 
Uh, I said to them, I'm an accountant, I check things. I was going to say, can you hear me at the back? And then before I said, can you hear me at the back, which is a terrific punchline, isn't that very funny? Uh, someone said, shouted out, uh, we can hear you at the back. Right. It was certainly a psychic heckle. I mean, how would they have understood what was in my mind? So this is what it's like to die. <laughs> I didn't understand why I was actually gonged. I was so naive. I was young, naive, and yeah, I am old and naive. I did my first gig in February '81. By which time, the guys who did their first gig in sort of the autumn of of, of, of '80 were old men. They were the guys. They were made men. You know, they were the they were the top notch hard gorillas of new wave comedy. It, it was horrible. I felt ill all day and. The comedy store was in this little strip club up in a lift, a very unpleasant thing. I remember leaving the tube station sort of 11 o'clock or so with the jams turning in the tube station at midnight, ringing in my ears. Now, I had a hankering after a pint, so I went in a pub, I said, have a pint of bitter and then a hankering, please. <laughs> She said, no, no, no. She said, if I can't hank you now, you'll have to talk to the hanker chief. And I said, for God's sake, this is the most appalling joke I've ever been stuck in. I did an open spot, which was a disaster. And it was a, it was a bear pit atmosphere. It was exciting. It was really exciting. And I died on my ass. Because what they used to do was, and they still do, you know, the open spot used to come on right at the end of the evening, which is about two o'clock in the morning. So you'd get there at sort of nine or something and then you got five hours to wait and be nervous and try and not drink. And I succeeded in all of those except the not drinking. Are you having, like, really good sex with your husband? <laughs> the comedy store was very competitive. There was a macho element there of, yeah. of um, you know, get up and do your two minutes. And... and would you last past the gong, you know? Honestly, <laughs> you are? No. <laughs> so really, it was about doing it fast. We and used furious, to get on. Which wasn't that, our style at all. We used all. to know that we would get fifteen quid at the end of the night, and just pray for the gong. Yeah, we wanted to get gong quite quickly because <laughs> you still got your money whether you got gong or not. No, I'm not having sex with my husband at the yeah, moment. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> really? How do you know? Oh, because I am having really good sex with your husband. <laughs> I did get angry a few times at the comedy store. Do you want to turn into was, a teacher one night at the comedy store? It was real rubbly, kind of. It was very late and people were fairly pissed. It was the River and... Police's stag party. <laughs> and they just, they... Like that. And go on, girls, get your shirts, your tits, get your things. And all this stuff was happening. And Dawn just looked at me and I'm sorry, I'm not going to stand for this. <laughs> and she, um, she said, right, now you are just going to shut up and we are going to get on and finish this sketch. Thank you. What I'm hoping, though, is that the Queen will go to Russia. I think she should. She's been invited. And besides, you know, the Russians are people, they really know how to treat royalty, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about the comedy store was that, that you have to walk through the audience to get to the dressing room, and vice versa, when you want to get out of the building, you had to walk through the audience. And if you've gone down badly, that's a very unpleasant experience because you've just got everyone looking at you thinking, there he is, he's, there's the one who thinks he's funny. Hey, loser. And uh, that was the worst thing, because I go around on a motorbike and uh, I used to go on stage and absolutely die a death, bomb, and go back into the dressing room and put all my motorbike gear on, including my helmet, and walk through the audience so no one would recognize me. And, and if they look at me, I just go, uh, pizza delivery, pizza, and get out of the building as quick as I could. She said... This was like coming home, the most exciting thing ever, to, to, to realize that there's a load of other people around who, who you know, you're not alone. So in that sense, I felt I was in at the beginning of something. You're as good in <laughs> People weren't quite sure whether I really was a crap folk singer or whether I was a comedian trying to be a crap folk singer. And I suppose I wasn't sure either. As you The 
atmosphere was like electric, and it was like a drug to us. Um, we used to come back from Liverpool, we'd be doing a gig up there somewhere, and it, if we could get back down into London by one o'clock in the morning, we, we'd go up on that stage. Once more unto the breach, dear friends. Once more! One of the good things about being a comedian is the, the crazy people that you meet along the way that you would otherwise not meet as an accountant. And one of these guys was Malcolm Hardy, who is perhaps a legalised psychopath. The last impression? <laughs> that was God. <laughs> Moving in a mysterious way. <laughs> I very first came across Malcolm Hardy when he had a Punch and Judy show. In fact, I booked him some years later for a Punch and Judy show for my small children. And uh, Mr Punch um, suddenly appears, and all the children are sitting there with their mums and dads, and Mr Punch suddenly appears and uh, sort of pisses over the whole... all the parents and the children, and they're all sort of left in tears. Well done, Malcolm. One of our sketches was um, dancing with dustman lids on our feet. Very hard because what happens? You, you actually put um, a shoe on the dustbin lid, you put bolts through them, then the bolts stick through your feet. Imagine that. <sighs> it's not easy. In many ways, the um, granddaddy of British alternative comedy is Malcolm Hardy. Stiffen the sinews! Summon up the blood! We performed at the Comedy Store with this Henry V thing for about, mm, about a year. And it always went down well. And uh, Rip Mail and Aid Edmonds on the same bill, they went down well. Knock, knock! Who's there? And I think I kind of hated them, really, because they, were, they weren't doing stuff about Northern Ireland or... <laughs> Open the door! <laughs> <laughs> but it was obvious that they were stars right away. Open the door! Hello. Someone said, why don't you try this place, the comedy store? So we went down to have a look. I've never seen anything like it before. There was all these naked girls in there, which is great, because uh, all the barmaids were topless and everything, because it was a strip club. Open the door, please, I want to come in! <laughs> I went in and uh, got the seat right in front, and, in front of the audience and Alexi came on and held a gun to my head. He was the first one on and he came on with a gun to my head and uh, I shat myself. It was, it was fantastic. I'd never seen anything like it. And uh, that's when we decided that we wanted to be on there. You just opened the flopping door! <laughs> just opened the flopping door, hell! <laughs> what? <laughs> I think we first became aware of alternative comedy when we were at the tram shed because there was one time around about 1980 when a new director, artistic director, came to the tram shed and he wanted to do different things, so he kicked us out. And uh, he brought in Rick Mail, Aid Edmondson and Alexi Sale in our stead. He was big and nasty and hairy and the veins bulged right out of his face. His skin was all warty and wrinkly. Uh, but with ghoulies, that's often the case. At the time, the comedy store had just started off and um, Rick and Aid were 20th Century Coyote, Alexi was around, The Outer Limits were around, and um, Rick and Aid did, did some midweek shows there, first of all, I think, when this new director boat came in. And, and I remember going to see them the very first night that they were down there, and it was fantastic. Get every ladies ever we are the dangerous brothers! <laughs> Dangerous brother. I told them. We came away and talked about it for days, saying, "Look what they're doing! It's so so different f from everything we do." And having uh, discussed it, we decided we were better to stick with what we do because trying to do a pale imitation of what they did so brilliantly wouldn't have been us at all. So we we stuck with the smut, really. Oh, but when you're dragged off by the ghoulie, it's bound to bring tears to your eyes. It couldn't have been more different from what, what you were used to. I mean, I've been quite used to going around, you know, the summer seasons and the, 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 the traditional big uh, clubs, that Talk of the North and uh, Caesar's Palace. And you went and you sat down, you had a meal, and then you watched the cabaret, and it was a big night out, whereas what, what you had in the comedy store was a club that you felt you owned, it was yours, it wasn't... There weren't dress code rules, there, were, there was certainly no pretensions to be eating, it was a few pints and some pretty rough-edged humour. I thought all... all conventional comedians stank. And they did, really. I mean, they, they were awful, you know. Even the ones that are supposedly revered now, like... I mean, I suppose they had... The, I mean, I hated them all then, you know, Les Dawson and... What a crap. 
<laughs> and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the wife's ugly. But last Christmas, she stood under the mistletoe waiting for someone to kiss her and she was still there at Lent. <laughs> In fact, she went to see that film, The Elephant Man, and the audience thought she was making a personal appearance. There was that sort of comedy bow tie and uh, an evening wear and uh, sort of northern club comedians uh, telling jokes about a man who went to a pub or, you know, your mother-in-law and stuff like that, which uh, I didn't have any rooted objection to it in, in any way, but it didn't really seem to relate to, to uh, sort of young people or, or people in their sort of teens and, and 20s. Most stand-up comedy did revolve around the sex war. You've been around, haven't you, girl? <laughs> You didn't get a mouth like that, sucking oranges. There were an awful lot of mother-in-law jokes, an awful lot of fat wife jokes, and an awful lot of jokes about black people being lazy, etc. I would never believe these people say it's just a joke. It's just a joke. Hello there. <laughs> I've just bought myself a new car. Come and have a look. And I went out, I've never seen a car like it. The biggest car I've ever seen. I mean, everything they got's bigger than ours, isn't it? This is racism. This is overt racism. It's no point saying this is funny. This is playing on people's prejudice and fear and misunderstanding and everything that racism is. It is impossible to overstate how sad and lonely and tragic those old guys are, you know what I mean? The, the Mannings and stuff like that. I mean, vile human beings that they are. You hear about the Pakistani wanted converted, so they took him to League's rugby ground and kicked him over the bar. <laughs> they can't touch people at all. All they can do is gags, you know, they have no... Yeah, the Davidsons and that. I mean, they are such tragic characters, you know. Everyone's saying, look at him, get out of the way! And it's the whole near on you. <laughs> and he's going all red. <laughs> Looking back at it now, you think, oh, blimey, I mean, did we really laugh at jokes that just said, aren't puffs funny, aren't women weird, and uh, aren't, these, uh, aren't these black people rather odd? This nigger walked in this pub with a f***ing big pallet on his shoulder. And Obama said, where have you got that from? And the pallet said, Africa, there's f***ing millions of them. It was inherently obvious that you weren't going to be making jokes that, uh, that poked fun at people simply because of their racial origin. Traditional comedy tends to be the sort of setup where people share jokes and, like, Bernard Manning or Jim Davidson will go out and do the same set of jokes, whereas in what we call alternative comedy, everyone writes their own material, so to some extent what they're saying to the audience is coming from them and kind of coming from their heart. It's a fairly safe bet that had Bernard Manning wandered into the comedy store on fire, several young comedians would have cheerfully urinated on him. Although this shouldn't be construed as an insult, it was normal fire drill at the store. But apart from the shared dislike of mainstream performers, there was little else that bound the alternative comics together. Soon their backstage differences began to show. I quit the comedy store and tried to strangle Peter Rosengard because he was so annoying. Alexi and I had this very peculiar kind of relationship in that, well, he tried to kill me one night. <laughs> Next piece, next piece. Peter Richardson then set up this place called the Comic Strip. As you probably know, the Comic Strip is a whole new concept in alternative entertainment. Which was, um, at the outer limits, Peter Richardson, Nigel Planer, Rick Mail, and Adrian Edmondson, me and Arnold Brown. The comedy store was clubby, uh, with a smallish stage and lots of tables. And this, was the, what's now the Boulevard Theatre, was, was a series of seats. Uh, and we were on a weekly wage. We were running from Tuesday to Saturday. And uh, we were getting money for a weekly job. That was our weekly job. The very first, first time, time we, we went, went there. The comic strip. The first time we went to the comic strip, um, it was an, for an audition. Dawn and Jennifer very quickly joined us. They came once we'd got the place and, and, and they actually auditioned. <laughs> And they desperately needed uh, uh, women, really. Uh, so we went down. I was teaching during the day. And we went down for an audition and they took us straight away. It smelt very bad. And it was quite dingy because, you know, it was a strip club, really. And um, uh, we, we were lucky in that we were the only women for quite a long time. And so we at least got a dressing room to ourselves. The boys were all in the... You know, there was sort of ten of them in But it was one funny room. walking through. I mean, it's funny going to work at Raymond's Review Bar and being greeted by the doorman. <laughs> and going in and, and going to our funny little theatre. It, it, was, it was kind of nice and it felt very nice and very safe and very friendly, actually. We're Shut up! 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 You look back on it now and you think it was a bit, it was dingy and dirty and a bit odd. But actually, that's how we lived then. When am I going to get my break? When am I going to get famous? Why? Give me a chance! Why? Why? 
Oh, I think there might have been rivalry between some of the boys, but I don't think it actually... I don't think they considered us worth being <laughs> rivals of. I don't really. think they noticed think us it, for quite a long time, actually. It was very easy going and everyone was friends and it was nice. It turned into a bit of a format quite swiftly, uh, as opposed to a club format where the lineup might be different. It turned into Alexi was comparing, The Outer Limits would be the first act on. <laughs> Then Arnold Brown would end the first half. And we're moving with the cult following. The cult following at the moment is the Hare Krishna movement. Second half, Alexei would bring on um, uh, Dawn and Jennifer, and then bring on Rick and Aid, who would who would wind the show up, and then Alexei would finish the show off. There's been a lot of racial trouble in the world these days, you know? Blacks and whites, Russians and Afghans. Don't know why they pick on them, I think they're fucking nice dogs. It had to be entertaining. We had to fill that place. What's green and hairy? It goes up and down. What? A gooseberry in a lift. It kills them. I'll tell it. I think it started with, uh, well, let's do um, just a joke. Like, two of us are trying to tell a joke and we just fuck up. Um, so, okay, what about that one about the gooseberry in the lift? But how is a little goose tomorrow going to get into a lift? <laughs> well, the fuck do I know? It's a joke. It's implicit. Sounds improbable to me. You get a two-line joke and you just not stretch it out to 15 minutes, but that is kind of half your feeling. <laughs> but get as much as you can out of it. Two guys who can't tell a joke. Well, maybe somebody brought the Gosbury into that lift. Well, you didn't fucking say that. No, I don't say anything. I am a fucking comedian. We were chic as well. People like Bianca. Bianca, was it Bianca? I can't remember. Four-letter night out for Bianca, I think it was. And uh, they called me Rick. Mail the four letter gag merchant. I put it on my passport. <laughs> so I thought it was cool. Yeah, that's my job. I'm a four letter gag merchant. Search my bags. There was a, a growing interest media wise and much discussion about whether, whether going on television would be uh, politically credible or, you know, whether it would be a sellout. Sellout or no, it wasn't long before they attracted the attention of eager young researchers desperate to find the next big thing on TV and grateful for the excuse to be able to wander around Soho on expenses. And as we shall see next time, after a few half assed and some quarter assed shows, now I'm one or two that would have killed for an eighth of an ass, the alternative comedians were ready to change the face of TV to suit their own image. Okay, guys, come on. As the one guy said to the other guy who was getting fed up, I'm getting fed up. I want to wash my smalls, and I don't mean to my tiddlies in a glass of water. Let's go. <laughs> right. And take that stupid girly bonnet off. Right, let's go.